the New Testament book of Philippians. You go, well, that's not a Christmas passage. Um, I assure you that it is, that I'm going to be reading today. Philippians, we're going to start in chapter 2. I want to read from chapter, in chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. And then we'll jump over into chapter 3 and read another passage that you may not associate with the incarnation, but it is, has to do with that. Would you please stand with me as honor God and his word? I know I just ask you to sit down, but... Philippians chapter 2, 5 through 11. The scripture says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God, a thing to be grasped but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And now Philippians 3 Verses 17 through 21. Verse 17 begins, Brothers, join in imitating me. And keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many, whom I have often told you, and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. And please join with me in a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we have asked that you make us sensitive to the fact that you are here. You're omnipresent. You are all-powerful. You've told us this. You have all authority. It's been given to you. But Lord, it's to your presence that we appeal now. It's to your Spirit, Holy Spirit, that you come in that you indwell each believer, and that you open the ears of unbelievers to hear your word today. Lord, we, we come from different places. We have different experiences of walking with you, but they're all made possible by you and by your power. And Lord, you know what you want to do in each of our lives. You know where sin hides, where unbelief hides. 
you know, Lord, where um, our security really is, if it's not in you. You know, Lord, what we value above you. You know whether or not that you are on the throne of our heart and our lives or if something else is. You know, Lord, what our future is. You know the day of our death. And so, Lord, as we gather today to open your word, we ask that by your presence, through your spirit, or through the spirit, that you teach us today. That you do what you promise, that you convict us if that's what we need. We pray, Lord, that you encourage us in our walk. We pray, Lord, that we hear your loving discipline and your loving word. We're all that prodigal, Lord, on the road. And you are the Father waiting. So, Lord, use this time today in this season in the scriptures that we read to teach us anew about you so that we may increase in our faith so we may um, grow to be like you. And that our time here, we can come away from it. Saying we have been in the house of the Lord. Gathered with his people. And we have been in your presence. We pray all these things in your name. Jesus, all God's children says. This is the first Sunday of what is known as Advent. And when you, um, if you're not familiar with the term, or you're not familiar with uh, the time of Advent, that's okay. I wasn't either. As a um, younger man, but it became important to me as I have gotten older in the faith, and as I... um, have grown to understand the importance of Jesus' birth, the fact that he became human. Um, the, the word itself, and I, I got this from a website called Got Questions. If you're not familiar with the website Got Questions, you might want to become familiar with that. In fact, we probably shouldn't link it on our website. It's a great, a great place to go when you just have questions about certain things. Um, and I, I sometimes use it for definitions and theological definitions, but this is one. The word advent itself means arrival or an appearing or coming into place. Now, over the years, the church has, settled, has celebrated advent for the purpose of focusing in on the, the birth of Jesus Christ. And there are different aspects and different ways of celebrating what we call Advent. Some people call it, in more evangelical circles, things like countdown to Christmas. Sometimes they, they use the themes of Advent or love, joy, faith. Um, sometimes it's light and joy and other things like that. And those, then particular churches will take themes and they will pick up on those themes each week. That's not what we're going to do. <laughs> not that we have a problem with faith and joy, or any, things of, uh, any type of things like that, you can see the Advent candle has now fallen. I see that. <clears throat> I want you to notice that, excuse me, I want you to notice that those are electric. There's a reason for that. Because I'm long-winded. And if you put evergreen, you're supposed to put evergreens around the Advent candle. If I preach the way I normally do and it gets down there, you might have a little brush fire on this little thing here. And I don't want that. So anyway, so they're, they're electric and um, it's okay. You know, it's, it's not that we're not making a theological statement by that being lying, lying down like that. But I'll, I'll try to work on it in the future. There's a problem with having one size for the candle that you put it into and the candle being larger. So these were made for real candles. These are not real candles. 
but they're supposed to kind of act like that. That's why they're flickering like that. But anyway, the, what we normally do is count down. The colors mean something, and we would count down to a white candle that would be in the middle, and that would be on the birth of Christ. So it's our plan that we go, we work through this to Christmas Eve and have a Christmas Eve outreach service this year, which I'm sure we're going to involve many of you in that as well. Um, so we know what Advent stands for, right? We understand that it's a rival. This particular series that I want to do is going to center on two theological truths that I think are the most important that we all understand, and there's two I words that we're going to be dealing with. The first is incarnation. I, I to this day, I have been a follower of Jesus for over 40, well, 40 years now. And of the, of the great theological truths in Scripture... The incarnation, the fact that God becomes human. He becomes his own creation. He doesn't lose any of his deity. Is still one of the most baffling theological ideas that has ever uh, been written about or thought about. Our God is amazing. And so the incarnation is the first part. That's what it means when we read in Isaiah 9, God with us. He'll have the government on his shoulders. He'll be called Mighty God, Prince of Peace. We read those sorts of things. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about a God who becomes flesh. And here's the definition. This is from Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology. And I use these because they're better at defining things in a short manner than I am, but here's how we define the incarnation. It is the act of God the Son. When we talk about the Trinity, there's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Another mind-blowing theological subject that we will get into at some point. But this is the act of God the Son, whereby he took, himse took to himself a human nature. Now that's important, the way that's structured. We'll get into more of that in a little detail a little bit later. The second I word and the focus for our Advent or countdown to Christmas as we go through this is this, imminent. And here's the definition of imminent. And you need to understand how important it is for you to get this. Because Christ has come. He is coming again. Now, that becomes more and more relevant in our time because we see things that are going on. And that becomes uh, something that the believer keeps his eye on. We don't just worship a babe in a manger. We worship a coming king. It's a part of our doctrinal statement. Amen? Amen? It's one of the four core things that we hold to. That's what those symbols mean. One of them is Christ our coming king. Here's how you define it. A term referring to the fact that Christ could return and might return at any time. Now while we're sitting here talking about the coming of Jesus as a human, we now are anticipating Jesus coming again at any time. And that we are to be prepared for him to come any day. Because that's important. We've been studying in Sunday school and Jeff's done a tremendous job of teaching this book by Dr. David Jeremiah and the outline that is there. 
But as I said to you before, I want you to get eschatology. Let me give you the most succinct eschatology, future things, that you can have. And that is this. Jesus is coming. That's all you need to know. You don't have to wait for any signs. All of the signs in some form or another have already taken place. We've had great tribulations. We've had world leaders that have come up. Now, God writes into history a picture of a coming event. That doesn't mean that the Antichrist has been revealed. I'm a pre-trib rapture guy. Don't, don't misunderstand me. But that time of Jesus coming, whether you go through the tribulation, whether you don't, is here. It's tonight. It could be next minute. Jesus is coming. And it is tied directly to his first coming. Remember what Paul said in Galatians? At the appointed time, God sent his son, born of a woman, under the law. And the whole point of that is at the appointed time. God knows when it is. We don't. But imminent means that he could return and might return at any time. Any time. In fact, the early church would say this as, a, as they would leave each other from their gatherings. Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus. It was on their lips. It was on their minds. And it has to be on ours. And particularly at Christmas. Because he came again, he's coming again. And because he walked this earth and because he died for us, he's coming again. And we can now start worshiping God in a new way when we open those presents on Sunday morning. I mean, uh, Christmas morning. Now I want to go on. So we've given you this, this overview stuff, and I want to... Um, always do this recently so anyway so now as we talk let me back up here let's talk about the incarnation first and this is this is kind of just an overview setting for what we are going to be doing as we go on but I want us to focus over the next four or five meetings on these two ideas Jesus came Jesus is coming you with me Jesus came, incarnation. Jesus coming is imminent. Okay? So he is bodily coming back again, and it can happen at any moment. We don't have to sit and wait for signs in the heavens or anything like that. He can come now. And there's an important reason why we know that, and we practice it because it affects the way we live. Okay, now, so let's start with the incarnation, which is, of course, the act of God, the Son, whereby he took to himself a human nature. Now, this is one of the classic passages that you would look to when you understand about God becoming human flesh. This is the angel appearing to Mary. Now, watch, because this is important. Um, because Jesus was born of a virgin, uh, the Virgin Mary, he did not have a sin nature. That's important about Jesus' humanity. Okay? Human the sin nature comes through human beings. Somehow the Holy Spirit did this in men. Wherefore, through Adam... We all became sinners, thought, word, and deed. You're born that way. It's not the act of uh, procreation or anything like that is the reason David said, in sin my mother conceived me. No, it is the issue of sin being passed down through us just like hair color and eye color. We all are born sinners. Thought, word, and deed. You may have a baby, and you look at that baby, and you say, oh, how wonderful this baby is. What an incredible miracle that is. 
And it's true. It is both our children, it was a fascinating time for me. I loved it when Ellen was pregnant because of just, I was in awe of what God was doing. I loved the ultrasounds that we would go and do. We both had ultrasounds. I loved all of that. And when the child is born, you know, you're checking, oh, we got 10 toes and, you know, 10 fingers, and you want to make sure that they're healthy. And, you know, Patrick was so big when he was born, you know, somebody in our, the church that I was pastoring at the time says, hey, pitch him the car keys, let him drive home. Newborn clothing, uh-uh, not a bit. It's a wonderful thing to look at a child, but they're little sinners. <laughs> they're rotten, doesn't take you long. Anybody that's lived through the terrible twos understands that children are sinners. We had terrible threes is what happened with ours. And it doesn't take them long to understand or you to understand that it's all about them. When they're born, it's all about them. Feed me, clean me, let me sleep. Me, 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 me. Well, it's just a small version of you is what happens. And God is going to do this. Now, but this becomes important because Jesus has no sin nature. And the, whole, the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Note, no human father. The Holy Spirit who is present in creation, you go back and look at it, is involved in creation. He is the one that's going to do this. He's the one that set the system up, folks. He knows how it works. If he can create a, uh, a man, and Adam hadn't have a sin nature until he and Eve ate of the apple. If he can, if he can um, uh, carve him out of mud, he can surely unite deity with humanity. But watch what happens. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you and therefore... The child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Now, that's the passage that normally people look at and they say, well, this is where deity and humanity come together. Okay? That's the incarnation. God with us. Emmanuel. One of my favorite Christmas passages, and I'll get into this on Christmas Eve, is a message passage from the book of John it's first John it's in first I mean, not first John it's in John the gospel in the first chapter in the way Eugene Peterson translated it, I love it it says the the word of God became flesh and blood and moved into our neighborhood that overwhelms me every time I think about it Jesus is one of us. But he's not at the same time. It's amazing to think about all of this. No, Philippians 2. Let's move there quickly. Now watch. There's a passage in here. Now you notice the context. It is the to the incarnation of Jesus that Paul is appealing to a group of people for them to be unified. Because Jesus comes humbly. So, we pick up verse 5. You go read the preceding verses and that's what you're going to find out. What he's saying is he is appealing to them, the church at Philippi, to quit being divisive with one another. And to be humble. And humility does a whole lot toward unity. This is the one thing that if we could learn this, we wouldn't have any problems in our churches. This is the one aspect of who Christ is that we need to learn. Now, Paul, of course, is in prison when he writes this. He's under house arrest. But this is a joyful book, but, and I encourage you to read through it at Christmas. So here we go. Have this mind among yourselves which is yours in Christ. This is what Paul's asking them. Okay? He's asking them to imitate the Lord. Who thought, 
who though, excuse me, who though was in the form of God. Now that doesn't mean that he was some um, ghost, anything like that. He was talking about his deity here. Did not account equality a thing to be grasped. Now you should underline that. Because Jesus wasn't touting who he was. He had every right to. He came to this earth in humility, the king of the universe. Can you imagine what it would be like to stand before people who are calling for your crucifixion that you created individually? You did. It's amazing to me that you know he he has a a relationship with them in some form or another. I don't know, but he knows us all. There's nothing beyond him. And the very tree, the very tree that was cut down to nail him to, he's the one that held it together. He's the one that grew it. I, I am blown away when I think about Christ's humanity. Because I'm human. I know what it's like. You're human. You know what it's like to be human. We're struggling with the sin nature. He didn't. But it was no less hard on him. Now watch what he does. What Paul writes about. He is using this as a reminder to a group of people who are selfish. It's one of the reasons we go back to this. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who through, though, excuse me, was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But you see the empty himself? He emptied himself. What's that mean? It gives us the explanation. By taking the form of a servant and being born in the light. The God of the universe. One of the, one of the best ways to understand this, this is called the gnosis or kenosis passage because it's tied to the Greek word when it talks about um, emptied himself. And there are several views about this and there's some heresy in church history. You can go read about it. And they say Christ you know, stopped being God while he was on the earth. And there are others that he's just human or... He was not really a, a, a physical body or anything like that. He, he was just a spirit being while he was here. The, there, are, there are cults like the Jehovah's Witnesses and others that hold to this kind of theory. But this is, this is the best way to describe what has happened. And it's a, it's a mind-blowing theological subject. It's like Jesus, God, just added humanity. He didn't stop being God. He just added humanity. That's what the incarnation is. He, Jesus, adds humanity. And he comes and stays with us. He lives with us for 33 years. He teaches us. The God of the universe comes and teaches us about what God really wanted to do with us from the very beginning. He wants us to be transformed into the image that he wanted us to be from the very beginning. That's what the incarnation's about. You know, and half the stuff that we associate with the, with the incarnation of Christ, the birth of Jesus, didn't even happen then. And we'll talk about that. These are, there are things that have just become tradition over time, maybe even like candles that fall over in the middle of your sermon. But the, the, there is um, the, the thing that I think the enemy wants to do for us in this time of year is just distract us from the truth. We get caught up in so many traditions, folks. And we need to get back to what's important. Incarnation's important. 
I was looking over. Do you, do you get sick this time of year of all the commercialization of Christmas? I mean, it just seems as though we are running around trying to find the right present for someone. We don't, you know, we got to have wrapping paper. We got to, you know, we got the meals to plan. We got to go to that goofy employee Christmas, you know, thing. If we ever have one of those here, I'm not saying they're goofy, okay? But you know what I'm saying, right? We get caught up in all kinds of things that have nothing to do with Christmas. Black Friday. I mean, I don't even know where the black part comes from. Does anybody know what that came from, comes from? What's that? The folks are in the black from that day. Oh, okay, I got you. It's an accountant term. There you go. Well, see, I learned something. While you're learning something. But... You know, I was, this is how bad it gets this time of the year. I was reading an article on Black Friday crazies. Y'all know what I mean when I say Black Friday crazies? Those of you that worked in the retail, I worked in the retail business for 10 years, and we didn't have Black Friday back then. But I do understand what it's like to go shopping on Thanksgiving or after Thanksgiving for those deals. And this is a writer this is an article from someone, um, I'm trying to see, I think it's actually in Reddit magazine, and it was reprinted in People. And here's how crazy things have gotten, and I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but peep, you, these are people who, that worked in um, the commercial sector, and they saw some really out, outlandish behavior on people. Uh, about people who were going into uh, buy things on a Black Friday. Here's one of my favorites. This woman. This is a report of these are reports of people who work at Walmart or Target or whatever. And this is one. I saw an elderly woman steal an ice cream maker out of a man in a wheelchair electric cart. <laughs> When, this is another one. Um, when I worked at Walmart, we had a fight break out over a bike. Fists were thrown and there was some blood. Eventually, one guy got a hold of it and managed to get away from the crowd. He rode the bike out of the store without pain. <laughs> Here's another one. Someone punched a security guard in the face because they thought he was a customer skipping to the front of the line. He was just walking in the door to start his shift. I watched a woman collapse in hysterics into my manager's arms because we didn't have the exact color of cooler she wanted. A lady called 911 because we wouldn't, we wouldn't price match with Best Buy. The police came and arrested her for misusing the emergency service. <laughs> oh, here's a really good one. Listen to this. When I worked at Sam's Club, we caught a woman stuffing the inside of her pants with frozen lobster tails. She would unpack them and throw the trash in a stack of tires that were on display nearby. This is crazy stuff people do. And then there's one, I think there's one more here that I want to read to you as we're getting, we're talking about this. Um, here's one. There was a lady who stood in line for ever she was the first in line she got there earlier she'd been lined up for 10 hours we had tons of things on sale and most people were trying to score the deals on the fancy electronics except for one person in line at the beginning nope she waited all that time for what buy one get one candles okay i'll share with me one more one more, okay? Y'all can go look at these. I got I to gotta share with this one thing. One of our male customers, 
he had another male customer upside the head with a crock pot. What were they fighting over? The crock pot. <laughs> Both customers had to be dragged out of the store by police. We get so many things. I mean, why? We don't remember. We're not remembering what this is all about. Why Jesus came to begin with. We've, the enemy's been so good at getting our focus off of what is in right and purposeful. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. By taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, listen, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Maybe you didn't stay in the manger. It's a cute lawn display. You know. We watch Peanuts animated series. Linus tells us what it's all about, and it's good. We have meals together, we buy presents together, we decorate trees. But every blinking light, every multicolored ball we put on the tree, every ornament that hangs is to be a reminder to us about who Jesus is and why he came. Second, because he came, he's coming again. Now, imminent, again, refers to the fact that Christ could return and might return at any time and that we are to be prepared for him to come at any day. Now, Jesus says this about himself. Now, remember, he came. That's the focus of Christmas. We, he came. He became our sacrifice. He came to teach us. He became human. By the way, he's still human and he's still God. He didn't get rid of the human part. That's going to be forever. He is going to be an earthly king. He didn't remove, that didn't go away when he died. He's still human. And God. Okay? That's important for you to understand. He is, he is a perfect high priest. He is one who constantly understands the pressures you are under. He understands if you've been struggling with covid Though he probably never had any sickness like that. But I'm sure he skinned his knees. I'm sure he had, you know, he had dirty diapers. He had dirty feet. We know that because he washed it. There were times he, he had to take care of his body. He had body maintenance. He understands it. He understands deadlines. He understands what it's like to be a carpenter and have somebody come in and say, I need you to make me a, a chair. And I'll need it next Tuesday or whatever. He knows that. He knows, he knows that kind of stress. He knows more stress than you can possibly believe, folks. But here's what he said. He said, therefore, you, must, you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Now listen, the only, the only application of that passage, that particular passage, is this. You need to understand this. You need to keep this in mind. And Christmas is a great time to be reminded of it. There's nothing left on the prophetic calendar that prohibits Jesus from coming. He's coming. And it could be before I finish. 
Lord, please. We don't have to deal with those leftovers or anything like that. We can, we can go have the marriage supper of the Lamb. That would be a great one, wouldn't it? Now look, stand in Philippians. I want to do this real quickly. Watch. Brothers, now watch how Paul has transitioned now from telling them because of who Christ is and the example that he is and his incarnation to now focus on that he's coming again. I've got to teach you how to, how to squeeze out a, um, a yawn. Because every once in a while I see people yawn out there and it makes me feel bad. So I'm going to have to teach y'all how to yawn without getting caught. Because you have, to, you have to kind of squeeze it out your eyes is what you do. You really don't open your mouth. You just kind of pass your hand over or you look down or you're like you're, you pass through the scriptures so that I don't see you at all and then you kind of squeeze it out your eyes. That's what you got to do. So let me go back to the passage. Watch real quick because brothers join me. Watch what he says. Brothers join me in imitating me. Y'all remember this passage that we have printed over here on the wall? Paul making disciples. Imitating me. That's where we're going with this. And keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. So when they're making disciples, and when you're making disciples, there are people watching you and learning from you like Paul learned from Jesus. You, you follow me here? But watch what his focus now becomes. This is the end goal. For many of whom I have told you and now tell you even in tears walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, that's going to happen. He's not talking about non-religious people, folks. He's talking about people whom Paul was very familiar with. They are Judaizers. They are trying to re-implement the law within churches. They have forgotten the grace of God. But watch what Paul does with the culmination of what's going to happen and what his focus is theologically. Watch. Their end is their destruction. Their God is their belly. Their glory is their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. Now, stop for a second. You see that today? Do you see that in a church today? Do you see that at Christmas? Do you see people whose God is their belly? Like to eat. They live foodies. Y'all know the term foodies? I guess in a way I'm a foodie. I, I like to prepare a meal. I like, you know, it's kind of like art in a way. You're putting taste together, you know, you like to do that. But I don't live for that. I don't worship for that. This is what, it's all earthly focused people. And there are people within the church and certainly people outside the church and especially at this time of the year, that that's what they're focused on. They don't, they're not worshiping Christ at Christmas. They're worshiping themselves. They're trying to get the best deal on, I don't know, their liquor or whatever. We're going to have some eggnog. I don't have anything against eggnog. You know, but if it's you know, 80 proof, you might want to reconsider that if you're going to drink a gallon of that stuff. And their end is their destruction. Their God is their belly. They glory in their shame with mindset on earthly things. What Paul is talking about here is something else. And here's the focus for us as believers. But our citizenship is in heaven. We don't live like they do. This is a reorientation process, folks. We are reorienting ourselves toward what is true and what is completely true in the thing that we hold to. Jesus is coming. That's what we're looking for. That's what we're hoping in. We don't give a flying fig about the coronavirus. You go, well, you haven't had the coronavirus. 
So well, you can not, you can, you, you're afforded that luxury. No. I have told you this. You are totally safe in the kingdom of God. Whether or not you get the coronavirus or not. I'm walking around here with a stint in my heart since 39. I've had Crohn's disease. I've had, a, I've had a doctor tell me, tell my wife, prepare to be a young widow. I understand health issues. I kind of got mine on the front end, I guess. You know what? I'm not stupid. I don't live stupid. But I ain't, I'm not keeping myself up at night because I ate butter on my biscuit and neither should you our citizenship is in heaven I'm going to let you in on a little secret folks Jesus Jesus coming second coming is imminent but you may meet him long before that happens all of us are going to have a come to Jesus day. At some point, every single one of us, I don't care how many vitamins you take, I don't care how far you run every day, I need to run, I get it, I understand. But you know what? You're still going to go. When God says it's time to go, you're going. There's nothing you're going to do about that. Now, that doesn't mean you go live frivolously. It's like the, the doctor joke. I mean, I may have told you this joke. I don't know. But the guy goes to the doctor, and the doctor says to him, he says, you know what? If you would run three miles a day, you'll add three years to your life. I'll tell this to somebody who likes to run. <laughs> and then the doctor said, but you'll spend it running. Now, you guys aren't that quick, are you? Point is, is that if you run three miles a day, you're going to spend three years accumulating that, adding it on to your life, but you're going to spend it running. Point is, is that, you know, I had another guy once, this is a true story. I had a guy who spent three or four days a week on his body. He was in his 60s. And he was, he was proud of his 60-plus-year-old abs and chest muscles. And he would, he would, he would say this. He would say it to, to me one time, and he told me, he said, you know, you told me that you had an accountability partner for your spiritual life, which I do. I do have an accountability partner. And he, and I said, he said, would you like someone to be accountable to, to for your spiritual health and, you know, help you and with that particular? I said, he said, do you want that kind of person? No, I do not want one. And then I told him jokingly, I said, you know what? I'm going to say his name was Rob. Not his real name. But he might actually watch the video or something. But his name was Rob. And, he said, and I said to him, Rob, you know, you may have a six-pack. I have a two-liter. I've been working on it for a long time. And he didn't know hardly any of the history of my early life and how sick I was and how small I was and, you know, how I had to work to get weight on. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm, you're going to put your nice clean abs, wonderful looking abs into the ground just like I am. Now, I'm not telling you I'm anti-exercise. I'm not telling you not to do those things. I'm not telling you not to eat right. But you know what? It really doesn't matter, ultimately. See, I live my theology. I, because if I eat like this, I'm to long to be with Jesus, right? <laughs> if I keep eating like this, I'll see him real soon. No, I'm joking. I'm joking, really joking. Used to drive nurses crazy. All right, so watch, listen. When I watch, what's the focus here? Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior. Unto us is born a Savior in the city of David, who is Christ the Lord. We all know the passage, right? 
What's the purpose of Jesus coming? To get us home. Who will, watch, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body? By the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. How's he going to do it? Light be. Light is. The great creator of the universe is going to do it just like that. Just like that. In the twinkling of an eye. Paul is telling these people to focus in. This is the purpose of theology, folks. This is why you know what you know. This is why you study God. This is why we like candles. This is why we were supposed to decorate trees. This is why we're supposed to write, wrap presents. This is why we're supposed to celebrate. This is why we use green. This is why we use red. The whole purpose is to point us back to Jesus. That's our celebration. That's the reason we celebrate Christmas. It isn't time off. It isn't those, or those things, time off from, from whatever it is that you do. It's not a vacation time. It's the purpose is worship. He's going to transform us. The greatest gift of all is that he has died for us. He has made us like him he has saved us by his grace. And that's why we are to get together. That's why we look at trees. That's why we celebrate. That's why we decorate. It's why we gather. Every week. It's why we get. Christmas is every week. You follow me here? And there's a new Christmas coming. It's called the imminent return of Christ at any moment. Now, so what do we do with that? Here's what we do with it. Well, let's start a new tradition at Christmas. Let's spend four or five weeks thinking about the wonder of Christ coming in the flesh. How God, how God from eternity past takes and adds to himself humanity. And what that means for us. You think you're going through this life alone? You're not. If you're a believer, if you're following Jesus, you're not going through this life alone. Jesus promises to be right beside you. He's in the driver's seat. You might be the co-pilot. You know, you've seen those bumper stickers, Jesus is my co-pilot. No, Jesus is the pilot. And that's where you got to, you got to, yeah. Or those... Other bumper stickers that say, uh, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. No, that's not right. God said it, <laughs> that settles it. The matter is, you believe it or not. Now, here we are at this point. And we, we, I want you to think about in the application part of this part. And as we start to think now and get ready to go home. I want those two words to be circling in your head this week. I want to be circling in your head as you wrap your presents, as you send out your Christmas cards, as you find that perfect present for those of you in your family. Incarnation and imminent. Because of the truth of one, it settles the truth of the second one. Now, the old world's going to get worse. Uh, but I'm, 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 I believe in the promise of the gospel. I think we're going to see us rethink this stuff. And some of the things that we've been doing, we may have to take and throw away. We may have to go, hmm, that's not helping. That's not helpful. It's okay. Might be painful, but it'd be helpful. Okay? And we'll go into a new year kind of thinking a little bit different. Incarnation, imminent, with me. And let's look at what those mean for me each day. 
want to pray with you. Lord Jesus, you are wonderful. I suggest that, um, I, or I assume, that you have answered our prayer, that you have been with us, that you have made your presence known to this wonderful group of people that you love. And Lord, we pray that we would get, that we would cut through the noise this Christmas season. And that, Lord, there is a, it, there is a miracle that has taken place. And it's not only happened because you came and that you're coming, it's because you changed us and you have offered to change anyone who wants to follow you wants to repent you've invited everyone into the kingdom so I pray Lord that if there's anyone here that hasn't made the decision to follow you accepted what you've done for us humbling yourself dying on a cross being raised from the dead appearing for 40 days to prove your resurrection still teaching and then ascending into heaven Sending your Holy Spirit to help us in this horrid walk we have on this earth until you come again. Lord, I just pray that they will do that today. I pray, Lord, that you would encourage every believer here. That you would whisper in their ears how much you love them. Even in spite of who they've been and who they are. But Lord, I also pray that you show us, all of us, what you want us to be. What you are working in our lives to be. And Lord, when we sing, um, joyful, joyful, we adore thee. It will come from our heart. It'll be on our lips. And we will truly worship you, not only at Christmas time, but every day. We pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Because we are dealing with the Christmas and we're doing